Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and uh, if you are up to date on the latest in uh, climate change uh, news, you'll realize that we're in very, very dire straits. For example, the southwestern U.S. is in a tremendous drought right now, and crops are being severely affected, and we're setting record temperatures. And this is because there's a powerful ridge. The jet stream is very distorted and there's a very powerful ridge that is just parked over the southwestern U.S. So it's getting extremely warm air coming up from the equator and it's just parked over over this region and we're getting tremendous tremendous um, temperatures, high temperatures. The soils have all dried out, so very, very severe drought conditions. We're talking about millennial, once in every thousand year type time frames or unprecedented. And of course, this um, makes the whole area susceptible to enormous forest fires this year. We'll likely see that in the next few months. That's just one example in one country, but the climate's obviously breaking apart. We're in we're undergoing abrupt climate change. We're getting a plethora of extreme weather events. And this is all negatively impacting the global food supply. And as climate continues to abruptly change, as we lose the Arctic sea ice, as methane starts to come out um, in larger quantities, and it's already coming out in larger quantities, um, and we lose Arctic sea ice and get a blue ocean event, we're in a completely new situation, a completely new, we won't recognize the climate of our planet and we'll have extreme difficulty in growing enough food to supply the global population with food. So we'll have food shortages, huge price spikes and inflation, um, not just in food, but in many other products and global famine. And do world leaders recognize this? Not at the moment, clearly. The G7 just had a meeting and they can't even get their act together to completely ban things like coal. So, you know, we're making strides in renewable energy, but we're certainly not doing research on ways to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. You know, we're not putting enough money into that um, and nowhere near enough. And we need to actually deploy things that, you know, I've talked about the three legged bar stool. We've got to slash fossil fuel emissions, eliminate subsidies. And they've been increasing in the last few years with the world in pandemic mode. Subsidies to fossil fuel companies. We've got to eliminate those slash fossil fuel emissions. We've got to pull CO2 and carb, you know, methane out of the atmosphere using carbon dioxide removal techniques. And we have to deploy solar radiation management to cool the planet to buy us time to do this. So I'm going to talk about a very promising idea that a University of Edinburgh emeritus professor, Stephen Salter, has been working on for many, many years. Um, basically, cloud brightening or specifically marine cloud brightening, um, is a very promising way to cool uh, parts of the planet and buy us time. And you can, if you're very smart at the deployment of these um, spray vessels, which I'll talk about in great detail, then you can actually cool ocean temperatures to reduce the threat from uh, super super hurricanes, super storms, for example, you know, forming off Africa, crossing the ocean, coming into the Gulf of Mexico, and smashing the U.S. coast, for example. You can, if you cool the water temperature to below that 26 and a half degrees Celsius, where these storms gain tremendous amounts of energy, then when the storms come into the Gulf of Mexico, that they would. They would not gain strength, but they would maintain strength, even lose, lose strength if you could cool that water. If you could cool some of the water uh, to, in the Indian Ocean to reduce the Indian Ocean dipole, then Australia will have more rainfall um, to reduce the fire activity, and Africa would have less uh, torrential rains and flooding. Um, 
if you were to deploy uh, enough spray vessels, um, you could actually cool the Arctic. Okay, so you would cool the ocean currents going up in the northern Pacific and in the northern Atlantic, which then bring warm water into the Arctic. So with spray vessels, you could cool those regions um, above where that warm water was and mitigate the Arctic melting. Deploying enough spray vessels, you could cool the oceans globally and reduce the dangers and risks from sea level rise. So you can do all of these things. So I'm going to go into the details. Um, the basic idea of cloud brightening is you don't create clouds. You make the water droplets in the clouds much smaller. When they're smaller, they reflect a lot more solar radiation than they do when they're large. And we know this. When enough of these drops coalesce into large droplets in, say, a rain cloud, you know, the sto those storm clouds approaching us, they're very dark, they're very black, and it's because of the large size of water particles in those clouds. If you go to smaller and smaller and smaller particles, the clouds are highly reflective and less likely to rain. So this uses, the first person to look at this was Sean Twomey. Um, he did cloud albedo measurements. He collected samples from clouds and measured albedos, etc. John Latham, Latham followed up with the idea of actually tinkering with the particle sizes uh, of the droplet sizes to make clouds more reflective. Okay, so I'm going to talk uh, about those by showing you, by going through some of um, Stephen Salter's uh, presentations. Just a few days ago, I was on a panel um, with uh, Meta Spencer from um, Toronto. Okay, she had Peter Wadhams and Stephen Salter and myself on to talk about cloud brightening. So we chatted about that for an hour. So please watch, uh, you know, that. please uh, just Google Meta Spencer cloud brightening videos, and I think she's got it up already. Um, and uh, I'm going to give more details on some of the presentations and some of the technical aspects and potential of what cloud brightening can do. Okay, so this is the latest iteration from Stephen Salter of what a spray vessel would look like. Okay, so you've got these... Uh, tall rotors here and they're called Flettner rotors and they spin and when they spin they create a high pressure area when the wind goes over them and they're spinning a high pressure area is created on the back side and a low pressure area on the front side of both of these towers and that propels the the um, the ship forward it's on these hydrofoils Okay, and these hydrofoils are moving out of phase. So if one of them, uh, you, you just change the pitch angle of the hydrofoil, for example, and if you tilt this wing down, this guy will drop down. You tilt this one on the other side up, that one goes up, and then you just adjust the motion here. So this whole thing cycles up and down. As this, this one goes up, this one goes down, vice versa. And when this one goes up, you have this one going down and this one going up. So they're out of phase both um, in both the transverse direction and the longitudinal direction. And what there's, there's impact pistons in here. And what that does is it generates energy to run the uh, pumps and things to pump seawater through fine mesh. And then you generate the spray. And you tailor the engineering so that you get 800 nanometer spray particles coming out. And when the water evaporates, if it completely evaporates, you end up with a 200 nanometer salt crystal. And it gets, it's in the boundary layer. They're very, very light. So turbulence and convection 
you know, in the evening, okay, these particles can hover near the surface during the day, but during the evening, the air cools, the ocean's still warm, so you get convective uplift. So these particles are carried up to a kilometer, one and a half kilometers or so, and water vapor goes to these salt crystals and forms the water droplets. And you tailor the size to get the droplet size that you want to generate these, so that the clouds formed are not large droplets and they're not a wide distribution of particle sizes. They're very specific droplet sizes in the cloud and they're highly reflective. So you can reflect, that reflects heat away from the surface. Okay, so let's go into the uh, presentation here. Okay, so first of all, I'm gonna talk about a, a couple different things. I'm gonna go over this presentation in detail. So how marine cloud brightening can be used as an emergency break on climate disaster. Okay, now there's a lot of different uh, proposals and things have been put together for COP26. It is coming up at the end of this year. And for, um, dealing with the, the scale of the numbers and to cool the Arctic, to bring back Arctic sea ice and to cool the overall ocean, to reduce sea level rise and to reduce sea surface temperatures to moderate extreme hurricanes and typhoons. And depending on where you put these ships, you can tailor different uh, things. So, so there's different sequencing of on off on off of these pulses and uh, you can tailor, you can really, with enough of these devices running continuously, and as the season changes, you want to move them to, to the optimal locations, you can get these transfer functions to, to do the cool type of cooling that you wanna do. For example, cool the poles a lot more. And there's a lot of ethics and governance involved in marine cloud brightening. Okay, and there is a, YouTube video that Stephen, where Stephen gave a presentation to the Royal Meteorological Society um, in Scotland, and it's about an hour long video where he talks about marine cloud brightening as an emergency break on climate disaster. So he talks about the presentation I'm going to go into, and there's a lot of good details in there, and I'm going to expand on what he's done. Some of the key points here which I want to show you is, so this is sort of the punchline here, okay? Depending on, so, so you can reduce, you can shave off the heating from El Nino's with these spray devices, okay? So this would be the cooled area involved in square meters. You'd cool the water down to 150 meters depth, reduce it by about two degrees Celsius or two Kelvin, do it over a period of two years and you can, with 212 vessels, you could really uh, shave off the, uh, war mo the greatest warming effects of an El Nino, for example. If you wanted to prevent hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, and in the Caribbean, the cooled area is given here, cooling the water down to about 50 meters by two degrees. You would do it for 200 days prior to hurricane season with 160 vessels, and that would really cut off the hurricane strengths. The Arctic ice, you need um, to, you need, uh, this is the uh, area of the cool, the cooled area, okay? Um, and you would, uh, this is the amount of energy that you would reduce. This is the amount of, and if you could get rid of this amount of energy that goes into melting the ice, you can preserve the ice. And you would, it would be, you do it over summer for 60 days. Um, and you would uh, basically reduce the ice melt significantly in the summer. So the ice could form thicker in the winter. That's with 42 vessels. You could deploy these things to save barrier reefs, coral reefs. Okay, so this is the sort of area involved that you'd cool down to 100 meters depth, two degrees Kelvin or two Celsius. You'd be doing it for a year with 47 vessels to preserve the, the coral reefs. If you, if you tried to um, reduce sea level rise, you basically cool certain areas of the ocean, okay, um, variable depths. 
you'd have to take an enormous amount of energy out, but you would, you'd be doing it over 20 years with 400 vessels, okay? Um, so these are the calculations.